The original of this tape has a few periods of static, but otherwise it is okay. We've been studying the tabernacle in the wilderness on our regular weekly Monday night Bible studies, and uh, we think this is quite proper because God has uh, felt that that was a subject important enough to uh, utilize most of the last 16 chapters in the book of Exodus. Beginning with Exodus chapter 25, we have this very detailed description of uh, this building that uh, was prepared in the mind of God and given to Moses in the top of the mountain and uh, in utmost detail. And then Moses, of course, uh, brought these details uh, back down to the children of Israel and they gave of the substance which they had brought out of Egypt in order to build the building. Now, we have found uh, through uh, the New Testament commentary on this building, particularly as we find it in the book of Hebrews, that each detail in this tabernacle has a bearing on our own Christian life and uh, what we do and how we come to God and how God has come to us. And we found that uh, the uh, manner in which God described the building of each item of furniture and, and each uh, a part of the building represents how God came to where we are in the person of Jesus Christ. And then, uh, as uh, he describes, uh, Moses describes how each item is to be built in the later chapters of uh, Exodus, uh, we have a description of how we come to God by Jesus Christ. And uh, so, for those of you that have not been coming, uh, we've uh, studied the, the doorway into the tabernacle, and we've studied the great brazen altar, which represents the cross of Jesus Christ, and then uh, the brazen laver, which uh, represents uh, the washing of the water of the Word as we would uh, cleanse ourselves through the Word for service unto God. And then we found that the items of, of uh, furniture within the uh, first part of the building represent Jesus Christ, the light of the world, as he illuminates uh, the truth of God to our souls as we become interested in what God is doing. And then we had the table of showbread, which... Uh, uh, represents the risen Christ as he is our sustenance. And then we, we went on into the tabernacle and we saw uh, the uh, golden altar of incense which represents our prayer approach to God. And then uh, within the holiest place of all, we found there the uh, Ark of the Covenant together with the mercy seat thereon representing the very presence of God. And so we found out that the degree which we want to know God uh, the degree which we're interested in finding out what he's doing in the world and uh, the degree to which uh, we would want to be involved, the, the, the degree to which we'd want to know him is represented by how far we go towards uh, that place where the very presence of God is represented in the holy place. Now, as we've been going through this, we've said very little about the high priest. The uh, uh, book of Hebrews tells us that the high priest... Uh, that ministered there in the tabernacle represents our high priest. The Bible says that we have such a high priest. And then a good share of the book of Hebrews explains how we have a better high priest, that we have one that's gone, we have a human being that's gone in the very presence of God. The book of Hebrews points out to us that after he gave his life on the cross, uh, that he ascended unto God to represent man before God. The glory of the Christian life is that there is a man in the heavens and that this man in the heavens has been the conqueror of death, has gone through the grave and out the other side to prove to us that God has such a plan for us. And in the book of uh, Romans, we're told that uh, if the spirit of this Christ be within us, that by the same power with which God uh, raised Jesus from the dead, he shall also quicken our mortal beings so that we can be with God and fellowship with him forevermore. Now, uh, we're told then that this high priest that the Israelites had represents uh, in various aspects Jesus Christ in his present high priestly ministry. Now, we've already pointed out that what Jesus did when he was here on earth, what he did historically, uh, he did for us. That is to say, he lived a perfect life for us. Uh, he died a death for us. He did something for us. And that which he did for us was to save us from the penalty of sin. 
The Bible says the wages of sin are death. And, and he saved us from that penalty by what he did in his life and in his death and his resurrection. He lived a perfect life for us because God's requirement is perfection. You and I can't be perfect. We needed someone to come from heaven's glory, live a perfect life for us, uh, to meet God's standard for us. And if we'll ever get to heaven, it will be because God has individually imputed that perfect life that he lived in his humanity to our account. And we get to heaven, not based on any good that we do or any good that we can do, but based upon whether or not we have received for ourselves God's gracious provision in the life of Christ, that perfect Christ that he lived. He lived on this life as a human being without sin. And then he died on Calvary's cross that he might pay our sin debt. So we needed his life and we needed his death. And then the Bible tells us uh, that after he did that for us to save us from the penalty of sin, he went right up into the glories uh, and to do something uh, within us. And what Jesus is doing today, he's doing in us and he's doing it through us. In the book of Acts, the first chapter, uh, uh, Luke writes that... Uh, what Jesus did in his earthly ministry is what he began to do. And what was done in the book of Acts is what he, the risen Christ continued to do. So what he did in the past tense, he did for us. What uh, he's doing today, he's doing in Christians and he's doing three, through Christians. Uh, all the work that God is doing in the world today is being done through human agency in one way or another. So he's doing something today. The risen Christ is operative today in this world, in and through the lives of those who've come to him uh, for salvation, to those who've availed themselves of his past earthly ministry. Now, the glory of the Bible message is that Jesus not only uh, has done something in the past for us, and that he is willing to do things in us and through us today, but he wants to do something in the future in concert with us. And just as surely as he saved us from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, and just as surely as he's willing to save us today from the very power of sin over our lives, one day he wants to take us to be with himself from the very presence of sin. So now what we have here, uh, we have a picture of the great high priest, of the high priest, is a picture of our great high priest, and God in the book of Exodus uh, devotes two entire chapters just to a description of how this high priest was garbed, uh, what his uh, uh, clothing consisted of when he was performing his duties. Those of you who have your Bible, turn, if you will, to the second book in the Bible, the book of Exodus, and we'll be looking here at chapter 28. And in this chapter, uh, you have a description of all of that beautiful uh, apparel that was worn by the uh, uh, the high priest as he served there in the tabernacle. Notice in uh, chapter 28, verse 2, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and beauty. Now, what we are having here is Jesus Christ depicted in his present ministry, the glorified Christ. He's a Christ of glory and beauty, and the high priest that ministered here on earth was dressed in glory and beauty that he might properly uh, represent him. Now, notice uh, you're given a, a listing of the various garments that he wore in, in verse 4 of chapter 28. You won't time, take time to read them all. In verse 5, you're told that they uh, were made of gold and blue and purple and scarlet and linen, or white, that is. Now, we've had this before, and for those of you that haven't been here, each of these colors is emblematic. We need a high priest who is God, and gold in the Bible, whenever it's used, Figuratively, it's used as uh, to represent uh, divinity or deity in manifestation. And we're told in the, in the Gospel of John that Jesus came to this earth to show forth the glory of God, to show forth uh, his excellence. The word glory, which you find many times in the Bible, means excellence on display. And the excellence of God Almighty was displayed in the person of Jesus Christ, but only as it was veiled in his humanity. But now the Lord Jesus Christ is in all of his glory, just like he was seen on the Mount of Transfiguration by uh, Peter, James, and John on that day when he glowed with a brilliance. And he's there in his glory. And he's represented then in his present ministry uh, by, uh, by this, this apparel that uh, is furnished here for the high priest. Now... Uh, the apparel is, is used much gold. There's much gold used in it. And this is to depict that 
Only a high priest who's qualified to show forth the very glories of God, the very excellences of uh, the nature of God himself, uh, can qualify as our high priest. And then the blue represents his heavenly origin. A high priest uh, on earth alone, where uh, this is explained for us very carefully in Hebrews, that he would have the same problems we have. He would be subject to the same uh, sinful tendencies. He would be subject to the same death. We need someone with a heavenly origin. We need someone from outside of this death domain. And then the purple represents his royalty. The Bible tells us that the ruler of this world, the king of this world presently, is the highest of the angelic beings, the highest of the created beings, uh, one whose name was Lucifer, the bright and shining one, uh, who fell from God's grace because he rebelled against God in his own pride, and we know him as Satan and the devil. And we know that the reason there's wars and sickness and, and so forth on the earth today is because he is in control uh, of the world system. So uh, this one uh, who would be our high priest uh, must uh, be a king. He must be stronger uh, than the one that's in this world. And that's why the Apostle John says, the one that is within us is greater than he that is within the world. What he's saying is, is Jesus within is greater than the Satan without. So he must be uh, clothed in purple. He must be clothed in scarlet because he must have presented an acceptable sacrifice unto God, and only a perfect holy life uh, could do that, uh, giving uh, God uh, the uh, sacrifice that was necessary. And then the white stands for the absolute perf uh, perfectness of his human life. He never sinned a sin. I have listed in the flyleaf of my Bible at least five places in the New Testament and many others in the Old Testament that declare unequivocally that in his human life, Jesus Christ never sinned. And that's why uh, he can be a proper representative before a holy God for you and I. Now, if we would read on, we're in the, the uh, 28th chapter of Exodus, and if we were to read on here, we would uh, find uh, quite a number of things about this, uh, this apparel that he wore. For instance, if we read on in verses 7, 8, and 9 and so forth, we would see that there were golden epaulets on his shoulders. And in each one of these epaulets was an onyx stone, and on... Uh, one onyx stone on his left shoulder were carved the names of six of the tribes of Israel, and on the onyx stone on his right shoulder were carved the names of the other six uh, tribes of Israel. And this is to show that Jesus Christ, this was to show first that the, the high priest of the people of Israel uh, presented all of them equally before God. And they were whole, held in the place of strength, and it represents to us uh, that one that bears us up on his shoulders of strength, and the same strength is equally available for all. Now, there were 12 tribes of Israel. You'll find 12 is a number much used in the Bible. It's a representative number. It always represents something, just like the 12 tribes of Israel represent all of God's people. The 12 apostles represent all of those who would follow Jesus Christ as disciples. And so we have... Uh, all of God's people represented in the place of strength as he would appear before the presence of God, bearing each one uh, upon his shoulders. And then, if we were to read on, we would find that why that was in verse 12. We're in Exodus 28, verse 12. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod, that ephod's the name of the garment, and, and for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord, upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Now, if you uh, read on here further, you would find that he also had a breastplate. And this breastplate had on it four rows of precious jewels of 12 different types, one jewel for each tribe. You can see them listed here, beginning in verse 17, and thou shalt set in its settings of stones, even four rows of stones, and the first row shall be of sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle, and the second row shall be an emerald, and a sapphire, and a diamond, and so forth. Now, in verse 21, we're told that these stones shall be with uh, shall be inscribed with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, the engravings of a signet, every one with his name, they shall be accorded uh, to the twelve tribes. So what we had here, we had each tribe named twice on the high priest, one on his shoulders and one uh, on his heart. Now, uh, you'll see the comment on this if you uh, look at verse 29 of Exodus 28, and Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. 
when he goeth into the holy place for memorial before the Lord continually. Now, the twelve separate types of jewels represents God, the fact that God regards us each as an individual. Uh, we're all different, and God will treat us differently throughout all of eternity. Now, this is a great mystery because he loves us all the same. In one respect, he has to treat us all the same, and that's represented by the two onyx stones exactly alike uh, in the golden cases upon his shoulders, and all of our names are written there. So we can be sure that he won't uh, treat anybody any better than anybody else. We all have equality in the eyes of our God because we're all his creatures. However, we're still individuals. And so we each have our name uh, next to his heart. He knows us as individuals. We're not just a, a lot of blobs of something to our God. He knows the hairs of our heads. He has individual purpose for each one of us. And that's represented by uh, these uh, precious stones that were in the breastplate as he appear, uh, appeared before God. So all of these things. Now, obviously, we wouldn't have time tonight to go through all the descriptive material of the apparel of the high priest. But every little thing, down to the minutest description, is highly representative. And it's very profitable, if we would just want to know and understand. Now, gems, jewels, precious stones as a whole represent the innermost thoughts of our God. And these... Uh, these precious stones are carried on next to his heart to show that we are in his innermost thoughts. Now, the psalmist thought that was something to sing about. And so many of the psalms are about the thoughts of God towards us. We don't think much about that. We don't regard very, God very much. We think of him maybe as somebody to bail us out of trouble uh, if we uh, get too sinful. Or we think of God as maybe saving us from hell or keeping us uh, uh, somewhat... Uh, uh, keeping our senses somewhat within us if we just uh, uh, go to the depths of despair or something like that. But God wants us to think of him as somebody who loves us individually and has very, very kind and delicate thoughts uh, towards each one of us. And as I say, the psalmist thought that was something to sing about. So now in the presentation, remember again, you have the presentation of these garments, the descriptive material about these garments uh, uh, in chapter 28 of Exodus in a very detailed manner. And then again in chapter 39, you have almost the same detail, except that is describing the making of these garments. So you have two complete accounts. And uh, there's much food for the soul here, uh, but this is about all the time we can spend directly on that. I want to be sure that you understand that these precious gems on the uh, breast of the high priest speak of you individually as you are a precious jewel in the sight of your God and he has he called yourself and that as he has loving thoughts towards you. Now let's let the psalmist help us to understand this. Uh, for instance, uh, let's look uh, in the 33rd Psalm. Now we can leave Exodus for the time being and we're going in Psalm chapter 33. And... Now, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be learning something about what God thinks in regard to us. Uh, I suppose it never occurs, occurs to many people that God thinks. He has thoughts. Well, what does God think about? Well, the psalmist is going to tell us. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Now, this is uh, to assure us that these precious jewels carried next to the high priest's heart uh, represent that God wants to treat it. We're precious in his sight. He wants to treat us as individuals. We're close to his heart and that he has this same regard for every generation. God does not love the generation that was here when Jesus Christ walked on this earth. He does not love that generation one iota more than he loves this generation. These precious thoughts of his heart towards us are unto every generation. Now, let's see uh, what the focus of these thoughts are. Turn on over to Psalm 40, verse 5. Psalm 40, verse 5. And we find there where he says, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. Now, that's uh, uh, somewhat of an archaic uh, uh, statement, but it certainly gets the picture across. What does God think about? His thoughts are usward. Now, that ought to give us a, a, a lot of, uh, of encouragement. 
Thy thoughts are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, uh, they are more than can be numbered. So God thinks a lot. He has many thoughts. And they're towards us, and they're to every generation. All right, let's go on uh, to uh, Psalm 92, and let the psalmist tell us some more about the thoughts of God. Psalm 92, verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Now, in, in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, we're told that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That the ways of God are not the ways of man. The thoughts of God are not the thoughts of man. Just as the, the rain comes down from heaven and just as the snow comes down from heaven, so his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we don't comprehend them except we know him and we understand how he thinks. Now, the glory of it all is that God is willing to reveal to us his thoughts that are usward. Now, uh, if I had time, I could go through some other Psalms and they tell our reaction to that. And God says, we don't care much about his thoughts. We don't really care. We're much more interested, for instance, in whether we have a, a bigger house or a nicer car or whether we have uh, plenty to eat or we have the clothes that we want. God says we're more interested than that and we care very little about what God thinks. We're just not that interested. We're more interested in what some... Uh, uh, cesspool-loving celebrity uh, says and thinks than we are uh, what God thinks. And, and God makes that condemnation. I could uh, show you some psalms uh, that, uh, that say that, but uh, he says that's just how we are. And I think if we would carefully uh, look into our, our own hearts, we would agree with the psalmist in Psalm 10. He says, God is not in all of our thoughts. But we're in his thoughts. And regardless of, of whether or not uh, he's in our thoughts. So here's what we find so far. The psalmist says about the thoughts of God. He says that they're to every generation. He says they're to usward. He says they are very many. And he says they're very deep. Now, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, you're told the only way that you can ever plumb the depths of the thoughts of God. Number one, you must have the mind of Christ. In order to do it. And uh, that's why uh, in, in one place it says uh, uh, we, we don't have the mind of God, but Jesus has the mind of God and we can appropriate his very mind. He will impart to us how he thinks. And then we can appreciate the thoughts of God. But he doesn't do that just uh, uh, willy-nilly. He doesn't cast precious pearls before the swine to be uh, undertrodden. And You've got to really want to know God. You've got really got to want to know what he's thinking about. You've got to want to understand him uh, before he'll reveal his thoughts because they're very deep. And the deep things of God are revealed by the Spirit of God by comparing Scripture with Scripture. We get that all mixed up. We think the way to know God is to uh, uh, compare version with version. But you'll never know God that way. You know God not by comparing version with version, but, but by comparing verse with verse. That's, that's scriptural. Compare, if you want to know the deep things of God, all you'll know by comparing version with version is one man's opinion against another man's opinion. But God reveals his own thoughts, his own innermost feelings that are represented by these precious jewels on the next to his heart uh, by comparing scripture with scripture. There's a, a passage in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 28, and it says, Would you like to be weaned from the bottle? Would you like to stop drinking milk and grow up? Well, he says, uh, well, we might as well. I'll tell you what, we'll turn to it after a while. But we got another verse or two to look at in the Psalms here uh, about God's thoughts. Uh, let's turn next to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. This whole psalm. It's about God's omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. And uh, in verse 17 of 139th Psalm, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. Here again, he tells how many thoughts God has and how precious they are. Verse 18, If I could count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with thee. 
You cannot plumb the depths of what God thinks just by spending an hour a week in Sunday school. You won't even uh, halfway skim the surface. If you're no more interested in knowing how God thinks than to go to church once or twice a week, you'll never know in this world. It's only uh, when you express a deep desire to understand his deepest, most thoughts, and it says here they're very precious. That's why God represents them by these jewels, the most precious jewels that can be found on this earth. When God wants to represent uh, the most precious things, he used jewels. He says uh, that's better than gold and silver. And so he's trying to tell you that it's a precious thing, it's a valuable thing to understand how God thinks. And to understand uh, what uh, what God is doing in the world, and particularly what He's willing to do in and through saved people. So many of us say, "Well, I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I'm on my way to heaven. Uh, that's it. Now everybody else get on the same bandwagon, and we'll sing glory, hallelujah." Well, that's just the beginning. That's just the opportunity to know your God. And this is what this life is all about, that we might seek to know him. And that's why the Apostle Paul, after he'd spent a lifetime of service to the Lord Jesus Christ, after he'd given his life to him, after he says, I don't count my life for anything, after he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But he says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Although he could say that, he could cry out in his own heart, oh, that I might know him. Oh, that I might know him. He didn't mean, oh, that I might be saved. He says, I want to understand how he thinks. I want to understand what would cause him to leave the the ivory palaces on glory and come down to this uh, old sin-cursed world and, and walk with his feet in the dusty roads of Palestine and let his face be spit upon and let the... Uh, rulers of this world uh, nail his hands to a cross when he was the king of glory. I want to know, Paul says, what would cause a a being, what would cause my creator God to have thoughts like that. I need to understand that type of thinking. And so Paul cried out to his last dying day that I might know him. He says, I count everything else but loss. I don't care for anything in this world, but I want to know my God. That was his heart's cry. And God says, that's a precious and valuable uh, aspiration to know your God. Now, well, let's turn over just a moment uh, to uh, uh, to the book of Isaiah. Uh, first, let's uh, look, uh, stop by chapter 28 for a moment. Uh, verse 9, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall God teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Who qualifies to know and understand what God teaches? It says those who are weaned from milk, those who are drawn from the breast. And then he gives the formula. Those of you, I see some of you are still looking. It's uh, Isaiah 28, uh, verse 10 now. For precept must be upon precept, and precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I want to tell you, you don't get that just by uh, a cursory looking in the Bible uh, so that you can maybe teach uh, the junior boys Sunday school or something uh, once or twice during the week. You get that by having the same heart cry that the Apostle Paul had that God's a great God. God has great thoughts. God's thoughts are towards me. God's thoughts are precious. I want to know those thoughts. I want to understand my God. That's more important to me than anything else in this world. uh, That's the attitude of someone uh, who uh, uh, put line upon line and precept upon precept. I want us to look for just a moment at Isaiah chapter 40 since we're here. And this is a prophecy about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it brings out this point of his shoulders and his breast. Because notice, uh, now this is an Old Testament prophecy of the coming of the Good Shepherd. And it was written 700 and 70 years before Christ ever showed up on this earth. In Isaiah chapter 40, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his works before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently meet those that are with him. Uh, young. I'm going to tell you, the one that came to have to do with us, the one that came out of heaven's glory to be one of us, is a strong one, but yet he's a tender one. And this is the same thought as we had described for us over in Exodus with the onyx stones on the shoulders, the position of strength, 
and with the precious jewels next to the heart, the, uh, the, uh, the place of love and adoration. While we're in Isaiah, we want to turn to chapter 55. I want you to see that scripture that, uh, that uh, we spoke of. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, And my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Oh, say, Christian, are you interested in knowing these high thoughts? Are you interested in uh, the thoughts of this uh, celestial one, these precious thoughts permeating your own soul? In this old sin cursed world, I tell you, it's the only thing of value here on this earth, is to know your God as the uh, Apostle Paul. Now, last week, in our Bible lesson, uh, we uh, pointed out the person of Mary of Bethany. And we found, uh, found her early in the ministry of Jesus Christ, while the others were content to serve. She was sitting in his feet, hearing his words, so that she might understand his innermost thoughts. And she was uh, ridiculed by those that were working hard, you know, for the Lord, uh, because all she wanted to do was to sit around and hear his word at his feet. But we find her there sitting at his feet, and then a little later on, when her brother was dead and the Lord uh, was about to raise him from the dead, we see her falling at his feet, and then uh, just six days before his crucifixion, we see her anointing his feet with the precious anointing oil, representing uh, or letting the world know that she understood that it was only because those feet deigned to walk upon this earth in perfection before God that she had any right to ever enter heaven's glory. That it was all wrapped in the fact that that one, uh, who was that gold one, that blue one, that purple one, that scarlet one, that white one, that was all of the, those characters. Those feet were the most precious thing she could have. contained in uh, the next 41 verses in the same chapter. Well, some of the most glorious truths in the whole world are in those 41 uh, verses. The 53 verses of Luke chapter 24 are presented to us in the form of a drama, a three-act drama. There are uh, three scenes in the first act, there are two scenes in the second act, and there there, there are three scenes uh, in the third act. And God brings these characters on the stage so that we can see what's going on, and then they walk off the stage, and somebody else walks on the stage. It's a, it's beautifully presented as a, as a drama. Uh, the first, uh, the first eight verses constitute scene one of Act One, and there we have these ladies from Galilee uh, who had seen where they laid him uh, when, when he was buried, and they went out on resurrection morning to see him. And the scene is in the garden uh, there uh, at the tomb, at the open tomb where the angels were. In the cast of characters are a group of ladies who were disciples, all ladies, several of them. Uh, three of them are named for us in verse 10, uh, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary. But uh, we're told in uh, chapter 23, verse 55, that there were others. And we're told in uh, the other scriptures here, uh, see in verse 10, and other women were with them. So it was a number of women. Uh, usually we think of only the three being there. But there were a number. They were, had followed him all the way clear down to Jerusalem from Galilee. They were Galilean ladies uh, who had come to Christ, and they wanted to show his respects and anoint his body. Uh, in the Mark account, it says they didn't know how in the world they'd get by that sealed stone, but they came in faith that they'd be able to minister to him. And when they got there, they were accosted by the angel. So we have this scene on resurrection morning uh, that we call Easter morning, and, and then... In uh, verse 9, 
uh, through 11, the scene changes back to Jerusalem, and we see these ladies there talking with the disciples and saying, look, we've, uh, we've been to the Lord's tomb, and he's not there. We saw some angels, and the angel says he's risen. He's not here. And uh, we're told in verse 11 that they could scarcely believe it. Uh, verse 12 is scene 3 of, uh, cha- of Act 1. Uh, we have uh, uh, back at the garden tomb uh, with Peter going there and discovering the linen cloths laid by themselves and discovering the empty tomb. Then in verse 13, beginning with verse 13, we have the beginning of Act 2, scene 1. Now, scene 1 is a, a scene on a dusty road near the little village of Emmaus. Uh, which uh, it says here, six furlongs from Jerusalem. To, I mean, uh, about six miles. Uh, three score furlongs. Uh, Sixty, sixty furlongs, or uh, uh, about six miles, I'd say, something like that. Anyway, they're walking along this road, and they're accosted by a stranger. He's next to me now. This is And uh, it should be interesting to us for no other reason than Jesus was able to make himself known or not known to show his resurrection body. And uh, the Bible says that we're, he's going to fashion us a body like unto his own glorified body. So, uh, to the junior boys, the Sunday school, when they get to heaven, uh, they're going to be able to uh, be seen or not seen, or recognized or not recognized uh, by their uh, friends as they choose. And we see the two disciples walking along this road. And uh, they have a very interesting conversation. They see this and they say, uh, Why are you so sad? And they said, Well, haven't you heard about all the terrible things that happened? Because we had a Messiah, and we thought that he was deliverance from the yoke of Rome. And we thought everything was going to be great. But, but he ended up on the cross, crucified. And he says, there's some strange things been happening. He says, some of the ladies, some of the ones we knew, they went to the tomb and he wasn't there. And they saw an angel. And the angel said that he was rose from the dead. Wonder. Now, you know, that's a strange thing. These two disciples represent us as we walk along the dusty roads of this life. And we know that Jesus is raised from the dead. Yet sometimes we're sad. You see, they didn't recognize just what power he had. There they were, side by side, walking along the road with the resurrected Christ, the one who'd conquered death, and they were sad. What an enigma. But it's just like us. See, uh, they said, uh, as you walk and are sad, and then they explain all about it, and notice in verse 23, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels. Seems like to me it'd be kind of hard to be sad if some angels told you that Christ rose from the dead. But they were. And he says, well, you're foolish not to believe all the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Or ought not Christ to have been subjected uh, to these sufferings before he could be glorified? Now watch verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, all the scriptures at that time consisted of the 39 chapters of the Old Testament. And what Jesus, the risen Christ, is telling to these disciples, he's telling them this, the entire Old Testament is about me. And dear Christian friend, if you ever will learn that every single story in the Old Testament is about Jesus Christ, you'll begin to read your Bible a little more. When you can see uh, Abel as the dying Christ, when you can see Enoch as the living Christ, when you can see Noah as the saving Christ, uh, when you can see, uh, when you can see uh, Isaac as the sacrificed Christ, when you can see Joseph uh, as representing Christ in his two comings, 
Or when you can see every story, when you can see that stick that's put in the bitter water, is the risen Christ put into the bitter uh, places of this life. When you can see Jesus is the, are the twelve wells of Elam. When you can see him, he, it's his strength that makes the iron float for all uh, Elisha. When you can see uh, him in every story, whatever it is in the Old Testament, then the Bible will begin to live for you. How can you know this? You can only know it if the risen Christ will let you know it. You'll never know it. Come into a Bible conference or listen to somebody else teach the Bible. You'll never get it out of commentaries. Never. Jesus needs to tell it to you. You need to have to happen to you just what happened to these uh, two, uh, two disciples. Let's go along. Verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village to which they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. And they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. I want you to notice something here. In the latter part of the 28th verse, it says, He made as though he would have gone farther. Now, these people were people that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They had accepted him as their Savior. Uh, They were his disciples. They had cast their lot with him. They said, We'll follow him unto death. death." They did follow him uh, unto death, but they were sad. They needed something. What did they need? They needed to know that the risen Christ will open up the Scriptures to the heart that will constrain him. Now, Jesus will save your soul and never interfere with your life. He's too gracious. If you're more interested in material things, if you're more interested in selecting your own life mate, if you're more interested in selecting your own occupation, if you're more interested in in selecting your own avocation, if you're uh, interested in selecting your own hobbies, you insist on going to the church you want to go to, if you make all your decisions, that doesn't keep him from saving your soul. He saves your soul because you cry out to him and say, I'm a lost sinner and I'll go to hell if you don't save me. Jesus saved me and he saves you. But he has more for you. But he doesn't interfere with your life unless you constrain him. Notice what they, he would have gone on. He, these people were sad. They needed something and he gave them what they needed. He ministered unto them. And then when he got through ministering unto them, he, he went on. He was going to let them run their own lives. And he'll do the same thing for you. You cry out and say, oh, Lord, everything's gone against me. I need you to help. He helps you. Then he moves on unless you constrain him to stay around. But they say, look, don't go. We want you to come into our ha- uh, house. We want you to be a part of every bit of our lives. We want to visit with you. We want to fellowship with you. We want to know you. We want to take you to our bosom. We love you and we want to hear from you. Please come into our house. Please stay with us longer. And that's what he did. He comes in like that at your invitation. Say, do you, have you ever invited the risen Christ to come into every area of your life? If you've ever said, come right into my home, come into my workaday world, come into my marriage, come into my romance, come everywhere. Lord, I just want you here. I want to be with you all the time. Won't you come be a part of my life? Listen, he'll steer clear unless you invite him. He only, he's an invited guest. He comes on invitation. How about it? Are you inviting him regularly? And you got to invite him every day. He won't just assume because you want him to come one day that you want him the next. But notice what they did. Verse 29, they constrained him saying, abide with us. That word abide is a very strong word. It's a word that says, I want you to come and be an integral part of me. Well, let's see what the result was. Verse 29 Last sentence, and he went in to tarry with them. He changed his mind. What changed his mind? What changed the mind of the risen Christ? A human soul that desired fellowship with him. That's what changed his mind. That's why he did go on, but why he came in to tarry. And the risen Christ does the same thing today. He's just as alive as he was that Sunday afternoon on this Emmaus road. Verse uh, 30, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. Now, here's another interesting thing. When you get a glorified, risen body, you can eat if you want to, but you won't have to. Won't that be nice? That's right. Several times in his resurrection body, Jesus ate with his followers. But he didn't have to, and you won't have to. But you'll be able to eat 12 manna of fruit from one tree if you like fruit. came to pass that he sat at meat with them. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Now, watch verse 31. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. They recognized him, and then he vanished out of their sight. That's another thing. When you get your glorified body, if you want to vanish, you can vanish. Sometimes he just vanished. Other times he went, defied gravity, went right up into the heavens. 
while they looked. Yes, he did. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing here? This same Jesus who is taken up from you shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go, and a cloud received him up out of their sight. So uh, you can depart whichever way you want to. Defy gravity or just defy every, every human law. But I want you to notice. Verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us along the way and while he opened the scriptures to us? Now, these people were tired. They'd been away on a festivity in, a, in another city in, a, in big crowds. And they walked all the way home down miles and miles of dusty roads on a Sunday afternoon. They were tired. They were bedraggled. They, they were just uh, foot-worn. But I want to tell you, when the risen Christ opened up the scriptures to their heart, I want to show you what they did. They were so filled with the power and with the glory of that, verse 32, and they rose up the same hour. They couldn't even wait on the next day. They rose up the same hour and ran all the way back to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and those uh, were with them. Now, they must have got excited. Hey, did you ever get that excited about being uh, within the presence of the risen Christ? So excited that you just had to go tell somebody how wonderful it was. Well, you're missing out in this old world. You're eating slop from the garbage can when God has the banquet table set, spiritually speaking. And that's pitiful. But most Christians spiritually eat slop with the hogs. Pitiful. Well, he did the same thing with these others. Chapter 24, verse 44. These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, and all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, in the Jewish Old Testament, or the Jewish scriptures, the Bible was divided into three parts. It was divided and it was called the Law of Moses. That's the first in the rings, which include the Psalms, the Psalms, the Psalms, the Psalms, and the Psalms. And then it was in fact just all Psalms because that's the more book that group. And then the prophets. It was a very different part. What are you saying in there? Every bit of the Old Testament is fine. Every word. Every story. Did you know that? And you'll never know him till you know him from the Old Testament because he's deep down under there. And if you only find Christ in the New Testament, you'll never really know him. Never. You'll just know a little bit about him. You know how to get saved, and you can even know how to lead somebody else to Christ. But you will never know him like Paul's heart cried out that I might know him. You never will. you got to qualify. What's the qualification? It's to want to know his innermost thoughts, his innermost motivations, more than you want anything else. It's that attitude, and nothing else will do it. And when you have that attitude, God will get you into this book. And you'll throw away all of these frothy modern versions and paraphrases and throw them in the garbage can and you'll get you a real Bible that's got good cross-references and that's got good uh, uh, chain references and you'll let God teach you and you'll stop trying to let some man chew your food first with his saliva and then try to eat what he's been chewing on. And that's what most of these paraphrases are. You say, well, I can't understand it. I want to tell you a story. Sorry, it's time to quit, and I got a story to tell, so you got to listen to the story. This story took place back in colonial days. And back in those days, of course, the only way to get across the Atlantic Ocean from England to the colonies was by sail ship, which took several weeks. But back in those days, every Friday, a sailing vessel left from the port of Southampton for the colonies. And every Friday, a sailing vessel left from the port of Boston for England. And that's the only way to get across. Now, there was a man in the colonies who was a chemist by trade. And he had a son that was 14 years old. And this father and son loved one another very dearly. Uh, they shared one another's innermost thoughts. And uh, uh, so one day, the, the son said to the father, says, Dad says, I want to be a chemist like you are. 
And the father said, well, son, you can't be a chemist. And he says, why not, daddy? Because there are no schools for chemists in this world, in this country. And the only way you could be a chemist is to go back over to England and go to school. And he says, well, daddy, I want to be a chemist. And he says, but son, it would take five years. And from 14 to 19, I wouldn't even see you and you wouldn't see me. We'd be separated for five years. And he says, well, I'll think about it a while. And he thought about it a while and he came back and says, daddy, I want to be a chemist like you are. And he says, son, says, only one problem. says, you know, uh, they censor all the mail and says we couldn't even write to one another without everything uh, we wanted to bear to one another would have to be shared with somebody else. And uh, the boy says, well, daddy, why couldn't we use chemical symbols for codes? And we could have us a code and nobody would know what we're saying to one another. We just know what each other's saying. And the father said, fine. He says, every Friday, I'll go down to the ship and I'll put a letter on the ship. And every Friday, when you get to England, you put a letter on the ship. He says, it'll be quite some while before I get one, son. Because he says, you've got to go all the way over there before you can put the letter on the ship. But you should get one within a week after you land over there. Because I'll be putting one on the very next ship. Ship should get there about a week after you get there. And so the boy went over and he rolled in school and he was uh, very diligently, diligent in his studies, had a very kind headmaster. And uh, the time came, though, uh, and he kept inquiring every day whether or not the ship had come in from the colonies. And uh, he found out that it had. And so uh, he was able to go down to the dock to where the ship was and wait. And he went down there and, and he followed where they took the mail and so forth. And he waited and he waited and there was no letter from his father. And he couldn't understand it. And uh, then somebody says, well, all the mail comes together to the headmaster, and it's addressed there, and uh, you have to get it through the school. You can't go down the ship and get it. He said, oh. So he went to the headmaster, and he says, is there a letter from me from my father? And he says, he thought a while, the headmaster didn't, says, no, son, uh, you heard no word from your father. And so the, the, the boy just couldn't imagine it. So week after week, he'd ask the same question, and he never got a letter from his father. And his heart began to pine away because if his father didn't love him enough to write him, then he didn't care about anything. And so uh, pretty soon he was bedridden. He wouldn't eat. And, and week after week went by and no letter from home. And so uh, finally, the headmaster decided that the young fellow was probably going to die. He was too, too ill to send him back uh, to uh, America and so forth. And finally, the headmaster came in and stood over his bed, and he had a piece of paper in his hand. And he said, son, I want to tell you something. He says, I don't know what kind of a father you've got, but he's been doing a horrible thing. He says, you asked me if uh, there was any message here from your father. And I've received something every week from your father. But he says, it's all written in chemical codes. And he says, I can't hardly decipher it myself. And he says, I've been working and trying. And he said, I've about got one letter made out. And I want to try to explain to you what your father is saying to you. And with every ounce of strength that that youngster had, he reached up and he snatched that piece of paper out of the headmaster's hand. And he began to read out loud exactly what uh, his father had wanted to say for him with tears streaming down his face. And the headmaster stood there amazed and says, how in the world could a young fellow the age of you know anything uh, uh, so much about chemical symbols? And how could you interpret such as that? He says, I know that you're telling me uh, what it's saying because I've been able to decipher some of it and, and I've got the gist of it, but you're reading it perfectly. I can tell that. And with tear-stained eyes, the young man looked up uh, at the headmaster and he says, Mister, do you think my father would write something to me in such a way that I would be unable to understand it? Well, I'll tell you, that's what's wrong with the average Christian today. Uh, they've received a love letter from their father, from their heavenly father. He carries them right next to his heart. He considers them a precious jewel. All of his thoughts are towards him. He does not want the world prying into everything he wants to say to them. That's why he's put this Bible in sign language. That's why uh, when he says, build with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, he doesn't mean literally. He means figuratively. He doesn't want the world. He doesn't want the... Uh, he doesn't want the curious eyes uh, of the intellectual uh, to, di to uh, get into to his secrets to you. He, he wants it written in such a way that only somebody that really wants to know can figure it out. Every symbol in the Bible is explained somewhere else in the Bible. Didn't you know that? 
Every piece of symbolic language in the whole Bible is explained somewhere else in the Bible. But you've got to love your father. You've got to want to know what he says. You've got to realize that he doesn't want the prying eyes of the world to look on his precious messages right from his heart to you. And you'll never know what's on his loving heart unless you'll dig in and you'll say, Oh my God, I want to know you more than anything else. And then he will uh, let you know the code. And you won't need the headmaster. Most of us spend most of our time trying to find a smarter headmaster so we can know a little bit about what God says. So we send them off to a bigger seminary and we wouldn't dare hire them for our preacher unless they've got 16 degrees. Because we think maybe I can finally find somebody smart enough that'll let me know. Maybe I can find a headmaster smart enough that can decipher the code. When all our Father wants us to to do is to love Him so much that we'll spend enough time with Him so that we can learn how He talks and how His thoughts are. He wants us to learn someday that His thoughts are high, His thoughts are deep. And He doesn't unfold them just to every curious mind. He knows how to write in code. And He'll open it up right to your own heart. I can't do it. He doesn't want me to. Now, he wants me to stand up here and tell you that such a thing is so. Because I'll tell you, I know from experience, we won't figure it out for ourselves. I was 35 years old before I even knew God loved me. I could have known if I'd have wanted to know before. So you need somebody to tell you that he wants to bear his soul to you. For those of you that were here before... Uh, You look with me in the Gospel of John, and we need to to close by looking in the 15th chapter of John. And this is what he told his disciples just before he left them. This he told them the night before he was crucified on the cruel cross. He said in John chapter 15, he'd just been telling them, verse after verse, he says, I love you. And he says, verse 13, he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And you're my friends, if you do my commandment. Henceforth, I'm not going to call you servants, for the servants doesn't know what the Lord does. But I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. He says this. It's great to have servants, and it's great to want to serve the Lord. But you don't bear your soul to a servant. You just tell him enough to get him to do what he's supposed to do. You don't tell him your innermost thoughts. And most of us, our greatest, those of us that have any aspirations towards God, our greatest aspiration is to be a servant. Well, there's something better than that. There's, there's such a thing as aspiring to be his friend. And he'll bear his heart to you if you'll just be his friend. Mary was his friend. How do you prove you're his friend? Because you're willing to lay down your life. You're willing to say, I don't have anything I want in my own life. I have no aspiration for myself. I just want to know and be with him. That's how you give your life to him. Have you ever done that? Have you ever told him, I know you died for me, and I want to be nothing for you. I want to know you. And if you want me for a friend, I want to be your friend. And I just love to know the deepest, innermost thoughts of your heart. (laughs) And not only will he tell you all of his thoughts, he'll tell you all the thoughts of God. And remember, there are many. The thoughts of God are numerous. But they're precious, and they're deep, and they're high, and they're to every generation, and they're to usward. Are you interested? Do you care? If you care, look for a moment at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Sometimes people ask me, Don, what got you started off on getting interested in the Bible? And where'd you learn the Bible from? Well, I want to tell you, I just believed what I'm going to read right now the first time I ever read it. I believed it with all of my heart. And I can tell you from experience, if you'll believe this, you're on the way. Jesus, in in, uh, Matthew chapter 11, prayed a very strange prayer, and it begins in verse 25, where we're told, At this time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now, I want you to notice, he's going to thank the Father for something, and I want you to notice for what he's going to thank him. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hidden, not revealed, thou hast hidden these things. What things? These precious thoughts of God. Thou hast hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. And reveal them unto babes. He's hidden them and he's revealed them. 
Now, if you want a dissertation on who's wise and prudent, Paul will give it to you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. He'll use these same words, and he'll explain this whole thing to you if you're interested enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. From the wise and prudent, and revealed and obey, even so, Father, for it seemed good to your thought, uh, in your sight. Now, will you believe this verse 27? All things, A-L-L, things, are delivered unto me, Jesus says, by the Father, and no man knoweth the Son except the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father. Nobody really knows the Father except the Son and somebody else. Now, the Son knows the Father and somebody else. The Son and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Oh, I say, are you interested? Do you want God's thoughts revealed to you? The risen Christ is in that business. If you'll constrain him and say, don't go, be with me. Heal my sin-sick soul. You say, Don, I want that. How do I do it? You do it just like you got saved. You said, I want a Savior. We'll just say, Lord Jesus Christ. I have a Savior. I want you for my friend. I want to know you. I, I, want, I want to know everything about you that I can know. I, I don't care what it means. I don't care what it's... I don't have anything I want as bad as I want to know you. That's how you do it. You talk right to him. You don't tell it to a preacher. You don't tell it to me. You don't tell it to anybody else. You tell it to Jesus. You believe that he's alive and risen. You believe that he's the omnipresent God the Son and that he hears everything you said just as surely as he rose from the dead. And you say, I want to know you. Oh, give me a desire to know you. And he will. That, that sounds simple, but that's it. I promise you. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray tonight that any soul here that wants to know their God would do business with you. Now, dear friends, right where you're sitting, why don't you talk to Jesus? He's alive. Why don't you first say, I thank you, Jesus, for living a life for me. I thank you for dying a death for me. Have you ever told him that recently? Have you thanked him recently? He can hear you. He's alive. In the quietness of your own heart, why don't you thank him? Jesus, I thank you that you came to this old earth and lived for me and died for me. Would you tell him that? We'll be quiet a moment just while you thank him. Now, if you want to know him, will you say, Jesus, I really want to know you. More than anything else, I want to know you. Would you tell him that? We're going to be quiet for a minute. Just tell him, if you mean it. Dear God, we pray that you'd make yourself real to every searching heart. In Jesus' name, amen.